I dropped my iPad yesterday and it appears to still be working, but uh, I don't trust it. We were at Cowboy Church last night and I was going to preach from that, but it seemed like the wind was, cha was changing pages on my iPad. So <laughs> I didn't want to trust it here, so I printed this out. And it reminded me that when I was uh, working in the church up north, a really good friend of mine, anytime I laid my sermon notes down up on the podium, uh, he would come by and he would shuffle the pages right before I would get up to preach. And so I put numbers on the corners. I don't know if any of you would do that or not. But we are going to be in Judges chapter 9 if you want to go ahead and turn to that. And we're going to cover the entire chapter 9 today, Judges chapter 9, as we work our way through this disturbing, powerful, incredible book from God's Word. And uh, we just spent several weeks, I think four weeks, going through the story of Gideon because there's so much of his story in the book of Judges. And, uh, and, and as we wrapped up last week, Gideon has died and he left behind a whole bunch of family. Does anybody remember how many sons Gideon had? 70. 70. I, I would say probably 71, right? Because he had... He had 70 sons from all these different wives, but then it mentions, and he also had a son from a concubine, right? So, um, you know, without a lot of commentary, um, I'd, I'd say that he probably had 71. Lots of family left behind, and as, as he slips from this life and into eternity, what we see is the nation of Israel continuing to slip further and further away from God. And this chapter that we're going to look at today is not a chapter about a judge, as we've seen so many judges come by and God use them to deliver his people, but this chapter is about the oppressor. This time, the danger that this nation of Israel faces is not danger that's coming from outside of the nation, but it's danger that comes from within. But once again, as we've seen in each of these cyclical stories God's mercy shows through as he delivers his people. So again, this story is not about a judge that was raised up by God, but it's about a poser. It's about a man that conspires to overthrow the leadership of this nation and usurp the leadership for himself. And it makes me think about this truth. If God is your king, he cannot be overthrown. He cannot be overcome. He cannot be overpowered. But if God is not your king, then you can expect chaos and conflict and disunity throughout all areas of your life. And friends, today I tell you that God is king. He is king. But you must decide to make him your king. And to become king, he didn't pull a sword from a stone. He didn't kill a dragon to become king. But he conquered sin and death. That's what God did for you to become your king. And he is a perfect king. He is perfectly loving and perfectly just and perfectly merciful. But you must decide to make him king. You must decide to make him your king. But I need some help this morning. How do we do that? How do we make Jesus king? How do we, maybe another way to say it is, how do we recognize or accept or acknowledge Jesus as king in our lives? Somebody, how do we do that? I got all day. Follow his word. Follow his word. Great answer. I don't know where it came from, but it was a great answer. Anybody else? How do we acknowledge Jesus as king in our lives? Live like him. To listen to him? Live like him. To live like him. To live like him, okay? To be a reflection of that king. Beautiful. Amen. To obey him. All right. Very good. And it's so important that we submit to the authority of our king. And his authority is expressed throughout his word. His will for our lives is expressed throughout his word. And friends, none of this that we've been talking about is seen in the text today. In fact, this story today can be seen as a metaphor of contrast. And so the big idea, if you're a note taker and you want to write this down, the big idea of the message today that I pull from this chapter 9 of the book of Judges is this. Jesus is our perfect king and cannot be overthrown. Jesus is our perfect king and cannot be overthrown. Recognizing him as such leads to wonderful blessings. 
Recognizing him as such leads to wonderful blessings. I look at that word blessings and I wrote it in my notes and then I immediately began to think about things and the way this word is used today and I think the word blessing is overused by health and wealth prosperity preachers today and I just want to tell you today that God's blessings are so much better than any of those temporary things that we hear promised today. God's blessings are eternal. That is what our king offers and his eternal blessings, they can start here and start now. So we're going to look at three lessons that we learn from this story in chapter 9. And it's really a contrast. And the first one is this, if you want to write this in your journals. Our perfect king teaches us contentment. Our perfect king teaches us contentment. So the writer of Judges is recording this moment in history, and he's inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this down, and he shows a stark contrast to godly contentment. So Abimelech is this 71st son of Gideon, the son of Gideon and his concubine, and he finds himself outside of the family looking in. He's sort of disconnected from these 70 sons of Gideon, Perhaps he's not accepted by the family at all. Really, no fault of his own. Maybe he's being treated as if he didn't exist. If you can imagine that today, I mean, can you imagine a, a world leader today that might have a, a, perhaps a grandchild and they just pretend like this grandchild doesn't even exist and, and the, the effects that that could have on that person? I guess it would have an effect on anyone. Well, in this case, Abimelech is not content with his place in life, and he wants to capitalize on the name and on the fame of his father, and so Abimelech took action. He goes to his mother's people, and we can begin reading in Judges chapter 9 and verse 2, and he says into the ears of the leaders of Shechem, that's the town that his mother was from, which is better for you that all 70 of the sons of Jerob Baal, which is Gideon, that they rule over you, or that one rule over you, remember also that I am your bone and your flesh." Now, we're not given any indication that the 70 sons of Gideon had any desire to rule. But we do see that desire in Abimelech, and that desire comes from a very dark place. So he begins to sow seeds of discord, seeds of division. He's whispering in the ears of the leaders. Can you imagine having 70 men ruling over you? Taxes times 70. The burdens that they would place on you. The authority that would be coming from so many different directions. Wouldn't it be better for you to just have one man rule over you? And don't forget, I come from here. I am one of you. We are of the same people. And then in a scene right out of Shakespeare, Abimelech is given funds that come from a pagan temple to raise an army of mercenaries. And then they go to the town that his father was from, and they slaughtered all of Gideon's sons right there in public, all but one. The youngest son, by the name of Jotham, he ran and hid, and he survived. But I think of the discontentment that we see in the life of Abimelech. You see, contentment means this. It means being mentally and emotionally satisfied with things the way that they are. And it seems really rare today to find anybody that's truly content. But the Bible actually says quite a bit about being satisfied. Jesus said things like this. Don't worry about your physical life. Don't worry about what you may eat or what you may drink or what you may wear. You see, the world chases after all of these things, and the world is never satisfied. It is a hunger for the things of this world that is a hunger that will never be filled. Solomon called it all meaningless. And we as Christ followers, we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We live this life knowing that eternity awaits us, and that is our priority. So we don't chase the things of this world as those who do not know God. The Apostle Paul was once a man that was on the fast track to power and influence and wealth. And then one day he met the resurrected Jesus Christ and he turned his back on his old way of life and he walked away from all of that and he began a new life without the kinds of comforts that we can easily take for granted. And Paul wrote these words in Philippians 4 verses 11 through 13. He said, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. 
in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In the Greek, the phrase would really read like this, I can do all these things. I can do all of these things through him who strengthens me. So I'll ask you, what are the all of these things that Paul is talking about? What is he talking about? You just said before. Yeah, what we just said. He's talking about being content in any situation, not letting your circumstances dictate your joy. He's saying, I can do that. I can be content in all situations. Those are the all these things. And he said, how do we learn to be content? It is through the strength of Jesus Christ. And Abimelech was not satisfied with his circumstances. And this evil arose from within him. And he relied on the strength of money and power and the army that the money and power could buy. So no matter your circumstances in this life, you need to know that God's strength will be enough. This world is temporary, but God's kingdom is eternal. So be content in this life because you have a hope and a future. So the second lesson that we learned from this chapter, our perfect king is worthy of our trust. Our perfect king is worthy of our trust. Now, the only reason that we experience contentment, regardless of circumstances, is because our perfect king is worthy of our trust. He's worthy of us placing our confidence in. This world and all that this world had to offer had failed Abimelech. He found himself with a longing for the things of this world that could never be satisfied. And sadly, like so many, he tried to lift himself up by putting others down. And tragically, that motivation led him to kill his half-brothers, all except for one. In this next scene, the young Jotham appears up on a mountainside, and the, the city leaders are there in the valley, I guess, and he begins to tell them a story, shouting from the side of this mountain, and he tells them a story, and he uses trees as a metaphor, but what he's saying to them is this, you wanted my father to be king. Remember, we talked about that at the end of the message last week. You wanted my father to be king, and he declined. You wanted one of his sons and his grandsons to be king. And he said no. And then in this story, he says, why do you now settle for someone or something far inferior? Now, not just inferior to Gideon himself being king or one of his sons being king, but, but far inferior to God's plan for their kingdom. Because remember, Gideon had said, God will rule over you. God is your king. Then just before Jotham ran away to hide again, he asked this question. Not necessarily to get an answer, but I think to poke at their hearts. And it's in verse 19. He said, if you then have acted in good faith and integrity with Jerob Baal, which is Gideon, and with his house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech and let him also rejoice in you. But then he goes on to say, if you haven't acted in good faith, if you haven't acted with integrity, may fire devour you. You know, we can see that it's pretty good that we can all use these times of reflection and self-evaluation, maybe without the curse of being devoured by fire. But it's important sometimes to just kind of sit back, look at the big picture and say, you know, what can I learn from what's going on in my life? Where do I place my trust? And not just mouthing the words, but where do my actions say that I place my trust? And if you look at how I invest my time and my money and my energy, am I storing up eternal treasures in heaven or am I focused on the temporary things of this world that will one day fade away? What kind of difference am I making in the lives of the people that I love? Am I teaching them to trust in temporary happiness or in eternal joy? We love Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Friends, it's so important. It's so important that we learn to trust God. And it is so important that we teach the generations that follow us to trust in God. You know, I, I say this all the time, and I'm going to say it again that it, it does my heart so much joy to see many generations gathered together here to worship. 
and these young ones getting to be in the room with you as you worship and as you study and as you pray and as you remember the sacrifice of Jesus through communion, they benefit from that. Week by week, year by year, there is a great benefit to them growing up. The older generation has much much to offer the younger generations here. And so I love to see all of us in the same room gathered together to worship. And we pray that the younger generation will learn to trust in the Lord with all of their hearts, not to lean on their own understanding in all of their ways to acknowledge him and to recognize that he will make straight their paths. And this word trust, it means to have a bold confidence in God. It means to take action based on the bold confidence that you have in God. It means that we trust in the promises of God as they are expressed through scripture. Promises such as those who seek him will find him. That his love will never fail. That all things work out for good for his children. That comfort and peace and guidance come through the Holy Spirit. That salvation comes to those who believe in Jesus Christ. That Jesus has prepared a place for us to spend eternity. A place where there will be no more tears and no more suffering. That Jesus will return one day as King of kings and Lord of lords. And because he is worthy of our trust, because we have full confidence in his promises, we live every day with the assurance and the hope of heaven. That he alone is trustworthy, not, not ourselves, not our own plans, not our own wisdom, not our own strength. That is not where we place our trust, but we place our trust in him and in him alone. And we learn along the way that it actually becomes easier. That we, we, we begin to develop a history of trusting God and experiencing the, the truthfulness of his promises as we mature and as we grow. And the more that we trust in him, the more that we trust in him. And there's a third lesson that we learn here from this chapter, another lesson of contrast. Number three, our perfect king gives us the capacity to love. Our perfect king gives us the capacity to love. Last week, we talked about how we as followers of Jesus Christ, we as a church family, even though we know that we will never be free from conflict, that we are going to live our lives in such a way that we are going to conduct our behavior in such a way that we will give each other the benefit of the doubt, that we will expect the best from each other. We don't assume motives when we're dealing with conflict with each other. We just talk about behaviors and that we make it very easy for someone who is in the wrong to change and to come back. Well, Abimelech has intentionally filled his life with the total opposite of those principles. He has surrounded himself with people just like himself. And after three years of his role, rule, not as a judge that it was raised up from God, but as an oppressive king, something very disturbing happened, and we read it in verse 23, that God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the leaders of Shechem. See, the leaders of Shechem are those leaders of the town where he had grown up, where his mom was. They were his people. They were the ones that gave him the money to hire the mercenary army that killed his brothers. And God sent an evil spirit between them. This phrase that God sent an evil spirit can be pretty disturbing to a Christian. We don't really understand what that means. And I'll tell you, I don't totally understand what that means either. It could have been translated as God sending a, a demonic spirit but it could also mean that God sent a spirit or an attitude of anger and distrust and hatred between the two. God certainly has all things at his disposal and he can use them as he chooses. I'm not going to question him or his authority or his motivation. It seems similar to me to God hardening the heart of Pharaoh, which was already a hard heart. He turns these evil men over to their own ruin. And then the rest of this chapter is filled with plotting and, and scheming and deception and double crossing. Here's just an example of the direction that things are going in chapter 9, verses 30 and 31. When Zebul, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gaul, the son of Ebed, his anger was kindled and he sent messengers to Abimelech secretly saying, Behold, Gaul, the son of Ebed, and his relatives have come to Shechem and they are stirring up the city against you. What happens next is that Abimelech rallies his army and he defeats his enemies, 
the very ones that had strengthened his hand to kill his brothers, the ones that had strengthened his hand to take power. And in one final scene, Abimelech and his army, they overcame the city, but the people retreated to a tower. And while attacking the tower, there was a woman who dropped the upper part of a millstone, and it hit him, and it crushed his skull. And Abimelech's final words were, you throw like a girl. <laughs> no, that's, no, that's not true. That's not true. But it was with his last breaths, with his last thoughts, did he confess? Did he repent? Did he show any regret at all? No, he didn't. His last thoughts were about how he would be remembered, not in life, but in death. He ordered his armor bearer to run him through with a sword, and I quote, lest they say of me, a woman killed me. Well, he did, and he died, and yet it didn't work because we know today that he died because a woman threw a millstone and it crushed his skull. We know exactly how this narcissistic jerk died. A woman killed him. I like to say it over and over again because it bothered him so much. A woman killed him. He had filled his life with selfishness and hatred, and he had reaped what he had sown. And the contrast to that lifestyle is what Jesus said was most important. In fact, Jesus said it this way. He said, these, these next verses, they sum up the entire Old Testament law and the prophets. And in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 39, Jesus said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the great and the first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Abimelech saw himself as a victim of his circumstances. He had been treated unfairly, and maybe that's all true, but it does not release you from the responsibility of your behavior. In verses 56 and 57, at near the end of this chapter, we read that God returned the evil of Abimelech, which he committed against his father in killing his 70 brothers. And God also made all the evil of the men of Shechem return on their heads. And upon them came the curse of Jotham, that's that youngest brother, the son of Jerob Baal. You know, some really smart guy wearing a tweed jacket once said, you can't really love others until you first learn to love yourself. Well, not so much. That's not really what Jesus teaches. I believe that Jesus teaches us that the capacity for us to love others, it really comes from first experiencing God's love. In fact, he says it this way, we love because he first loved us. And so as we love the Lord our God with all of our hearts, and with all of our souls, and with all of our minds, he changes us from the inside out. And we are able to love our neighbors as ourselves. We will never be able to love each other if we have not experienced the perfect love of our perfect king. Abimelech teaches us how to live a life of discontentment, distrust, and hatred. And he became king, and he was Israel's oppressor as the danger that he posed came from inside the nation, not from outside of the nation. And it was all in contrast to God's plan because God's plan was that he would serve as their perfect king and he would rule over them and he would do so perfectly. That God would go on to teach them as Jesus went on to teach us how to truly be content, what it really means to trust and what it really means to love both God and to love each other. But I don't know, I mean, does this idea of kingdoms and kings and thrones and swords and all this, does it seem really outdated to you? I mean, it's so, so long ago. But we do live in a kingdom. We live in a kingdom today, in a kingdom with a perfect king. And he rules with perfect justice and perfect love. And his perfect justice demands that our sins be punished. But his perfect love compelled him to take that punishment upon himself. And so Jesus carried the cross up that hill after living a perfect life where he was nailed to that cross, not as a martyr, not as someone that this snuck up on him. He knew exactly what was coming, and he willingly laid his life down so that he could be the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, so that he could be the sacrifice for our sins. 
as Phil said during our communion time, so that he could shed his blood and his body could be broken as he accepted God's wrath for sin, God's hatred against sin, Jesus took upon himself. But Jesus doesn't force anybody to be a part of his kingdom. He offers the invitation and then he waits patiently. And while I say that, I'm compelled to say that one day his patience will end. One day the patience of Jesus will end and he will return to take us home. And so the next step that I want to challenge you to make your prayer this week is this. Recognize Jesus as king right now and receive his blessing or wait until it is too late and receive his justice. In the Bible study on Thursday night, I think it was Jennifer that said, she talked about the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Today is a day of repentance. Today is the day of being baptized and having your sins washed away. Today is a day where refreshing can come from the Lord, a day of mercy and grace where the weight and the guilt of sin can be lifted off of your shoulders. You don't have to carry that burden any longer because he is king and he is your king. And friends, that is a fact. The only question is, will you recognize him as your king? Will you do it now? Or will you do it later? Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. If you're here today and you have never recognized or accepted Jesus as the king that he is, if that is something that you'd like to do today or you'd like to talk about or pray about, or maybe you've got questions, maybe we want to be here to help you work your way through that because we want to encourage you to let today be the day of salvation. Let today be the day that you recognize him as the perfect king with perfect love and perfect justice. You too are invited to be a part of his kingdom. And I want to encourage you to take that step. Let's pray and then we'll sing together. Our Father in heaven, we do love you. And we come today to worship you, to gather with family and friends. Really, really just family. There are no friends here. We're all family because we're all part of your family. You are the one that holds us together as family, Lord. And so as we gather together with love for each other and love for you, we pray that this time has brought a smile to your face. But Lord, we pray that we are challenged from your word. We pray that we are challenged to walk closer to you, to repent of sin, to confess you as Lord, not just in this place where it's really easy to do, but to confess you as Lord and King in the world, in our everyday lives, wherever we go and wherever we are, in places where it may not be so well received. And Lord, we trust you. No matter what the circumstances are in our lives, we trust you. We trust you with our lives here and now, and we trust you with eternity. And so we place our lives and our hopes and our futures in your loving and nail-scarred hands. And it is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.